Now turn to part one. You will hear a woman, Paula, phoning her friend Ralph about an application to the local council for money for their drama club. First, you have some time to look at questions one to three on page 66. you will see that there is an example which has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Hello? Ralph, it's Paula. Hi. You know I told you we could apply to the local council for money for our drama club. I've got the application form here but we need to get it back to them by the end of the week. I could send it on to you. You really ought to fill it in as president of the club, but I don't know if it'll get to you in time. Well, you're the secretary, so I expect it's OK if you fill it in. Yeah, but I'd really like to check it together. Right, that's fine. Night, the first part asks for the main contact person. Can I put you there? Sure. Right, so that's Ralph Pearson. The man's name is Ralph Pearson, so Ralph Pearson has been written in the space. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to three. Hello? Ralph, it's Paula. Hi. You know I told you we could apply to the local council for money for our drama club. I've got the application form here, but we need to get it back to them by the end of the week. I could send it on to you. You really ought to fill it in as president of the club, but I don't know if it'll get to you in time. Well, you're the secretary, so I expect it's OK if you fill it in. Yeah, but I'd really like to check it together. Right, that's fine. Knight, the first part asks for the main contact person. Can I put you there? Sure. Right, so that's Ralph Pearson. Oh, and then I need your contact address. So that's 203 South Road, isn't it? No, 230. Oh, sorry, I always get that wrong. <laughs> then it's Drayton. Oh, do you think they need a postcode? Better put it, it's DR68AB. Mm -hmm, OK. Telephone number, that's 01453 isn't it? Yes. Right. Now, in the next part of the form, I have to give information about our group. So, name of group, that's easy. We're the Community Youth Theatre Group. But then I have to describe it. So, what sort of information do you think they want? Well, they need to know we're amateurs, not professional actors. And how many members we've got. What's that at present? 20? 18. And should we put in the age range that's 13 to 22? No, I don't think we need to. But we'd better put a bit about what we actually do. Something like members take part in drama activities. Activities and workshops? OK. Right. That's all for that section, I think. You now have some time to look at questions 4 to 10 on page 66. Now listen 
and answer questions 4 to 10. Now, the next bit is about the project itself, what we're applying for funding for. So, first of all, they need to know how much money we want. The maximum's £500. I think we agreed we'd ask for 250 didn't we? OK. There's no point in asking for too much. We'll have less chance of getting it. Then we need to say what the project, um, the activity is. Right. So we could write something like, to produce a short play for young children. Should we say it's interactive? Yes, good idea. Right, I've got that. Then we have to say what we actually need the money for. Isn't that it? No, we have to give a breakdown of details, I think. Well, there's the scenery. But we're making that. We need to buy the materials, though. Oh, OK. Then there's the costumes. Right. That's going to be at least £50. OK. And what else? Oh, I just found out we have to have insurance. I don't think it'll cost much, but we need to get it organised. Yes, I'd forgotten about that. And we could be breaking the law if we don't have it. Good thing we've already got curtains in the hall. At least we don't have to worry about that. Hmm. We'll need some money for publicity. Otherwise, no one will know what we're doing. And then a bit of money for unexpected things that come up. Just put sundries at the end of the list. OK, fine. Now, the next thing they want to know is, if they give us the grant, how they'll be credited. What do they mean, credited? I think they mean how we'll let the public know that they funded us. They want people to know they've supported us. It looks good for them. Hmm. Well, we could say we'd announce it at the end of the play. We could make a speech or something. Uh, they might prefer to see something in writing. We'll be giving the audience a programme, won't we? So we could put an acknowledgement in that? Yeah, that's a better idea. OK. And the last thing they want to know is if we've approached any other organisations for funding and what the outcome was. Well, only National Youth Services. And they said that at present funds were not available for arts projects. Right. I'll put that. And then I think that's it. I'll get that in the post straight away. I really hope we get the money. I think we've got a pretty good chance. Hope so, anyway. Thanks for doing all this, Paula. That's OK. See you soon. Bye. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. You will hear a talk by a councillor on plans for the development of an old industrial site. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 13. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 13. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Councillor Norma Boyd, and welcome to this exhibition about the development of the old paper mill factory and gasworks site, which has been lying unused for more than a decade. There has been pressure on the council to use the land to build a training centre and a small business park. However, we have been encouraged by local people to create an open area for the benefit of the community, providing much-needed space for recreation. 
and I now have pleasure in announcing that the plans for the creation of a park, to be called Park Royal, and for flats, have now been approved. I'm also pleased to announce that we have secured sponsorship from local organisations. More detailed plans of the developments are available from the Council website, details of which are in your pack. In the meantime, I'd just like to take you through the plan here on the screen. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 14 to 20. Now listen carefully and answer questions 14 to 20. If we start here at the bottom, you can see Parkside Street, where the main entrance to the park is. On the left of the entrance, in the bottom left-hand corner of the plan, there will be a block of 40 studio flats. On the other side of the entrance, there will be some workshops for local businesses. There will also be another entrance here, on the top right, which leads into Pear Street. Here, in the centre of the park, we will have an ornamental lake with paths radiating north, south, east and west to the different areas of the park. In the top right-hand corner, just by the Pear Street entrance, there will be a large sports area with two football pitches and four tennis and volleyball courts. Just here, beside the pitches, on the same side of the path, will be an outdoor swimming pool. Now, in the top left-hand corner, a walled flower garden is planned with a rockery and a water feature with walkways, seats and lots of shady areas for the summer. Next to this, a sculpture garden is also planned. Now, let's see. Just here, below the walled garden, there will be a grassy amphitheatre with a permanent covered stage for open-air concerts. We hope that local schools and colleges will use this theatre to showcase student work. In the bottom left-hand corner of the plan, you can see that above the block of flats, there will be a play area for children. And directly to the right of this, just near the main entrance, there will be a wild area. More trees will be planted here, and in the middle will be built an educational centre for use by local schools to encourage children to take care of the wildlife and look after the trees and plants. And finally, in the bottom right-hand corner of the park will be a cafe, opening on to Pear Street. And now for questions. If anyone would like to ask anything, I and my colleagues are only too happy to oblige. Yes, the lady in the front row, if I could have your... That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. You'll hear a conversation between Astrid and Henry about the lecture they've just heard. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 30.
Now listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions twenty-one to thirty. Henry, don't you think Dr. Adam's lecture was really very good? He could talk about the telephone directory and make it interesting. All his lectures are like that, Astrid. He's just one of those people. I wish we had him as our tutor. I bet you that he is very demanding, though. Boris is in his tutorial group and agrees that he is brilliant, but he puts them under a lot of pressure. Hmm. But don't you think that's good? Perhaps. Anyway, he's interesting and rather funny. Did you take lots of notes in the lecture? Yes, actually, I did. In fact, several pages. I didn't think I had taken so many. I was that busy listening to what was being said that I didn't take many notes. Can I photocopy yours? I don't think that's such a good idea. You won't be able to read my handwriting, and sometimes I write them in English and sometimes in Arabic. Oh, let's have a look. Wow, your notes are so neat. Well, there's not much in Arabic. There is on this page. <laughs> yes, there is. Doctor Adams would be pleased to see this, especially given what he's talking about. Oh, don't you keep careful notes?、Mm, sometimes it depends on the lecture. I don't think I'll forget Adams's lecture today, but some of the details will fade. I type up everything afterwards, so you can have a copy then, and you can fill in anything I've missed. I'm not so good on the broader concepts. I'm better when it comes to detail. Just what Adams was talking about. Well, I am definitely a detail person. I need to have everything written down before I can get the concepts clear in my head. And I am the complete opposite. I find all the detail clutters up my mind, and I get very frustrated. Which was just what he was on about. He mentioned a book he had written. He mentioned several. The one on space and the individual. Yes, called My Space. It's on the book list. Hmm. So it is. I think I'll get that out of the library or get my own copy. Did you get what he said about spatial awareness? I didn't really. Yes, it was fascinating. I can't be as eloquent as Adams was, but I know several people who are frighteningly intelligent. But they have difficulty reading simple directions, even when getting to places that they know very well. I find that difficult to understand. Everyone learns the way to walk to the shops and things like that. You mean just the way people learn spelling? You know, people misspell words, make mistakes in countless areas of their lives, and going in the right direction is just the same. Remember what Adam said about the number of people who cannot tell left from right, north from south, and so on. Do you know which way is north? Um, it's that way. <laughs> you see, I couldn't have told you that. Really? I haven't a clue which way is which. That's why I'm always getting lost when I go out on my bike, and put me in a completely new place, and I am totally lost. What about maps? Oh, I'm hopeless at reading them. But then you're brilliant at writing essays and getting all the ideas down in the right order, and I don't know where to start. Again, just what Adams was talking about. What we need to do is combine our skills. You teach me to cope with detail, and I'll teach you how to string concepts together. Okay, we can do that. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. You are going to hear a lecture about the geographic information about Australia. You now have some time to read questions thirty-one to forty.
Now listen to the lecture and answer questions 31 to 40 by choosing the best answers from the choices. Good morning, everybody. We'll continue to look at Australia and today look at one of its greatest natural challenges water for the agricultural sector. As the only nation to occupy an entire continent, Australia has a unique environment, with much of it very flat and dry. One notable feature of the Australian continent is that it is the lowest of the continents. The average elevation is less than 300 metres, compared with the world's mean of 700 metres, and its highest mountain is only 2,228 metres, so it is overall a very flat country. It is also dry. In fact, Australia is the driest, after Antarctica, of the continents. Yet Australia has extremes of climate and topography. There are rainforests and vast plains in the north, snowfields in the southeast, deserts in the centre, and fertile croplands in the east, south, and southwest. And Australia contains some of the wettest areas on Earth. In western Tasmania and on the northern Queensland coast, but half of the continent has an annual rainfall of less than 300 millimetres each year, and only 20% has more than 600 millimetres each year. A major problem is that the limited water resources do not match up with where water is consumed. The major water resources are in northern Australia and Tasmania, whereas most of the agriculture and people are in southeastern mainland Australia. The agricultural sector is the largest consumer of both self extracted and main supplied water, using over 70% of total net water consumption. Electricity and gas supply, and water, sewerage, and drainage services use notable amounts of self extracted water. However, Net consumption in the household sector is the lowest, just 8% of total net water used. Australia's water use increased by 25% over the decade between the mid-1980s and mid-1990s. Much of this increase was due to irrigated agriculture, which, as noted earlier, accounts for over 70% of national water demand. Since the mid-1990s, the growth and profitability of irrigated agriculture has outstripped the dryland agriculture sector. Irrigated commodities contributed almost a third of total farm exports in the mid-1990s. The results of a special government report in 2000 showed that if today's water use arrangements continue, the water needs of the rural industries will outstrip water availability by about 2020. Irrigated agriculture, Australia's major water using sector, would be seriously affected by the short wall. And although groundwater underlies large areas of Australia, it accounts for only 4% of water use. So, clearly, apart from water for households, which mainly comes from dams or rivers, it is the rural sector where efforts towards water conservation are particularly directed. In this sector, the largest consumers of water are the meat and wool industries. One of the major problems in considering sustainable agriculture is the large amount of irrigated water used to produce these products. Some of the crops such as wheat, maize and soybeans also use a lot of water. Furthermore, many crops are grown in dry areas where up to half the available water evaporates from the soil surface or seeps down too low into the ground for the plant roots to reach it. Well, that's all we have time for this morning. 
you will be able to do further study on this topic in the library. And I have a handout here with references for those who want to come out to the front to collect it. Next week, we'll look at outback farming and... That is the end of part four. Hi, this is Old Spar. I would very much appreciate it if you could like, subscribe and share this video, as this will enable me to help more old students reach their old goals. Very much appreciate it. Thank you.